Our subject tonight is uh, the gospel of the colors. Beloved, the Bible is full of wonderful symbols, and when you become better acquainted with the Word of God, and these symbols begin to unfold, it is utterly fascinating. Now, amongst these is the symbolism of color. Color. In Ezekiel's vision, he records that he saw the throne room of God where the fountainhead of wisdom and power resides, and where... God sits at the controls of the entire universe. And Ezekiel saw such precision and such power that he could not find words to describe it. He saw God sitting at the hub of the universe and angels flying in and circling the throne and receiving their orders and being dispatched again. And he said it was like a wheel in the middle of a wheel. But there's one thing he was clear on, the dominant Color was burl, and burl is green. Now, John the Revelator was given the privilege also of looking through vision into the throne room of God, Revelation 4 and 5, and he said that God seemed to have had a rainbow encircling the throne. Now, we've all seen rainbows. The strange thing about this one was that John said it was emerald in color, and that's green. Green. Well, in an effort to see what these colors mean, Bible students and even the prophets have said that green is the color of hope. And right there, if you catch the vision, you ought to say, thank the Lord. Because at the throne of God, where every man is judged, where prayers are heard and prayers are answered and judgments come, according to the prophets, there is a symbolic color there indicating hope. Well, what is our hope at the throne of God? It is our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? And tonight, the worst sinner can get on his knees and come boldly to the throne of grace and have hope through Christ. The color there is green. The Bible speaks of white, which represents the purity of Christ. John saw the redeemed saints in heaven, and he said they all were clothed with fine linen, clean and white, indicating purity. Then the Bible speaks of gold, and we are told by one writer that gold represents faith and love. Faith and love. That's why there's a text over in Revelation that says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I've been to a country where 80% of the world's gold is manufactured, and on a certain day, I went 9,000 feet under the earth into a gold mine. And then they took me on a VIP tour to see how the gold is extracted. And finally, when they get down to a black, ugly paste, They put it in a kiln and heat it white hot. And when it comes out of there, all the impurities are destroyed by the heat and the gold gleams in its wonderful, beautiful color. The Lord says to you and me, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, if gold represents faith and love, what God is saying is, if you claim to have faith, then have enough faith to stand up against the odds. Stand up against temptation. Have enough faith that can stand in the hour of trial. Have enough faith that will stand through even when you're being tempted. Have enough faith to say no to the devil even though the temptation is very attractive and very alluring. Why don't you say amen out there? A lot of people are talking faith but they don't have any. They're just taking a chance on God and they love to sing I want the faith of our fathers living still. Well, our fathers had so much faith, they went into lion's dens and fiery furnaces rather than give up their faith in God. And yet we don't have enough faith to come out when it's raining. We can go to a football game and sit there in the snow. Well, when it comes to serving God, all we need is a little excuse, a tiny little headache, a drop of rain. It doesn't even have to rain. It doesn't look like rain. Well, I'd better not go tonight. Reminds me of that fellow who said to his girlfriend in a letter, Darling, I love you so much, I'd climb the highest mountain. I'd swim the deepest ocean. I would walk through fire and brimstone just to be near you. Sign love, John. P.S. 
I'll be over tonight if it doesn't rain. What? We talk in poetry and live in prose. God is saying it's time for you to back up what you say. If you love me, do you love me? If you love me, do what? I want love that is purified by trial and by by test and by temptation. I want faith that can stand for something. Love and faith that are tried in the fire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I was in the third grade, I can remember our teacher unfurling the American flag and explaining the symbolic colors of our flag. I can just see it right now in my mind's eye, and that was a long time ago, because I never forgot the lesson. And she said to us, when you see the blue in our flag, it represents loyalty, allegiance, faithfulness. You've heard that, haven't you? She said, and when you see the red, it represents sacrifice, the shedding of blood by which our freedoms were purchased. And when you see the white, it represents the purity of our government undergirded by the four freedoms. I've never forgotten that. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we ought to be thankful for America tonight. We've got some problems in America, but if you think that the problems are so bad you ought to throw America away, you ought to take a trip and see the rest of the world. Now, there are wicked men sometimes in high places who perpetrate unjust laws and and who will not even carry out the just ones and there are inequities in America. There is Jim Crow still extract in the land and there is oppression and mistreatment but still I thank God for America where tonight we can sit here and worship the Lord according to the dictates of our consciences. And we've got the best government in the world on paper. Dr. Martin Luther King gave his life in challenging this country to live up to the high claims of her creed, her constitution. My teacher said the blue represents loyalty, the red represents sacrifice, and the white represents purity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is significant to notice that all of that comes right out of the Bible. And I'm going to the book of Numbers, chapter 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 37. And I want you to listen as I take on the first one. It says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. A ribbon of what? And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart, and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring. That ye remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God. Would you say amen out there? Now, this was a long time ago. God said, Moses, tell all of my people to get a ribbon of blue and sew it on the fringes of their garments. And whenever they see it, it is to remind them that I am God and that they should be loyal to me, that they owe me their allegiance. If they are really my people, then they ought to be faithful to me and do what I ask them to do. And in case they are tempted to forget, every time they look at the ribbon on their arms, it is to remind them of my commandments to do those rather than do what their eyes desire or their hearts go after. They should be reminded even to put me ahead of their own desire. Would you say amen? And that's loyalty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that was the program of God way back there. And I know that sounds like a rather strange program. God says my commandments are my will. And these people have agreed that to obey my will and to be my people and to represent me to the heathen. And therefore, through them, I want to carry the gospel to all the world. Now, I want them to be faithful because the heathen are just let down when they see my people playing the fool and acting like hypocrites. 
So tell them, not only do I want them to remember what I said, but if they put that blue on their garments, it will remind them of my commandments when they want to do something else. It will remind them that I am God and I ought to be preeminent in their lives. They owe me allegiance because I not only made them, I set them free from slavery. I gave them water to drink in the desert. I rained down bread from heaven. I opened up the Red Sea, lest Pharaoh destroy them. I have sustained them. I have taken them in my bosom like a father with his little child. I am responsible for them. And they promise to be faithful to me. Tell them to look at the blue and remember. And put me first. Now let's see how practical this was. Let's say my Bible is made of solid gold, and I'm a Jew, and I want to steal that Bible, and nobody's looking. Now that's what my heart wants to do. The minute I look around and see nobody looking and reach out my hand to take that Bible, right in front of my eye on the bell of my sleeve is a ribbon of blue. Well, what's it there for? To remind me of the commandment of God. What does the commandment say? Thou shalt not steal. Come on and say amen out there. And it reminds me, it speaks to my conscience, it tells me, hey, you shouldn't steal that. You ought to remember God. You promised Him, you would obey Him. All right, here's a fellow that gets on my nerves. And you know, some of us have short fuses. And, and, and we can lose our tempers, isn't it right? And a man provokes me beyond measure. And I reach in my bosom and I pull out a knife. And I raise it in the air to take his life. And the minute I take that knife up, blue falls all down over my eyes. Reminding me of the commandments of God. What do they say? Thou shalt not kill. Here is a filthy-minded man who's gotten away from his wife and, and a filthy-minded woman has rendezvous with him and he is about to commit adultery. He can't even pull off his garment without pulling the hem of blue up across his eyes to remind him of the commandment of God. What does it say? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou art a holy people. Loyalty. Allegiance. And when God spoke His commandments to the Jews, they said to Moses, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And yet they never did it. They failed and failed and failed and failed. And God gave them a provision, gave him the, a remedial uh, arrangement by which they could come to him and kill a little lamb and somehow uh, atone for their sins by faith until the Lamb of God should come. And yet they tried and failed and tried and failed. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the two covenants, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to hear a lot of foolishness as people try to explain to you why you don't have to obey the Lord. They'll tell you it was nailed to the cross. I'm going to preach on that on Wednesday night. And you'll never, never have any more question about it. You might not do it, but you'll be clear. Because I'm going to nail it on the cross myself. Then they will tell you, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Took care of that Saturday night, didn't we? Now they're going to tell you, that's the old covenant that man is talking about out there. Well, that's what that is I'm talking about. Essentially, you don't have to be a theologian. Essentially, the old covenant was, obey and live, disobey and die. Adam and Eve were created under that covenant. God said of all the trees ye may freely eat, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Obey, live. Disobey, die. Clear as that. That was the old covenant. That was an arrangement, a just arrangement, that was made with a man who was built in the image of God without propensity to sin. But eventually man did sin. And the flaw of sin was planted in human flesh. And even Jesus himself says, the flesh is what? Weak. So here is a man who intends to obey God, but he has no internal power because the flesh is weak. And even though he would like to obey, he is constantly falling. God said, all right, put a ribbon of blue up there to remind you. In spite of the blue, he continued to fall. He continued to fall. And yet God would not let him go. So God said, we've got to come up with another arrangement. If man sins, tell him to go get a lamb and tell him to slay that lamb and tell him that that lamb represents the innocent dying for the guilty. But tell him that the blood of that innocent victim is to let him know that no man can sin with impunity. That blood must be shed for sin. 
that sin is dangerous and revolting and deadly. And if a man sins, somebody has to pay. And tell him that when he kills that little barnyard animal, it typifies the fact that the Son of God will come one day and pay for his sins if he'll only be faithful. Only be faithful. So way back in Old Testament times, God saw that because of the weakness of man, he couldn't even obey when he wanted to. So God introduced another color. God said, come now, Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason again. Beloved, I wish the scriptures got to you the way they get to me sometimes. Here is the great God of heaven who's got the whole world in his hand who upholds millions and myriads of worlds and constellations in the palm of his hand. All things consist by him and are sustained by him. And yet that great God up there looks down with tender pity upon one little speck of a planet, one little speck of dust on the balance, this earth slinging around the sun in all its abominable filth, peopled with folks born in sin, shapen in iniquity, in the eyes of almost anyone else, not worth thinking about. And yet God says, for that one little old world, and for just one man on that earth, I will send my son to die. And now here is the great God of heaven and earth, saying to wicked human beings, come now, let us reason together. Who do we think we are that God has to entreat us? Why should the God of heaven be solicitous to us? We have nothing to offer him. Even when we give ourselves to him, what have we given except a patch of lies and a bunch of sin that he's got to clean up with the blood of his own son? And yet God says, come now. Let us reason together. The Japanese Bible says, come now. Let's argue this thing out. Let, let's look at all sides. Oh, what a great God we serve. God said in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as... What color is scarlet? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool... The next verse we don't want to miss now. You've got folks who always stop short of the gospel. They always want the salvation, but they don't want the other. I've got to read the next verse. God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient. Did you get it, church? Way back in Old Testament times, God had tried his best to empower his people to stir up their consciences, to appeal to their good sense, to get them to live in harmony with the covenant he had with their fathers. But they failed miserably. God said, I've got to introduce another color here. And the color red is symbolic both of sin and salvation. I'm going to show it to you in a moment. God says, though your sins be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. When I was a boy, people were poor. Following the Depression, we had a lot of junk men who went around and collected junk. You know what I'm talking about. Then we had rag men. And they'd come around and get all your old torn up clothes and things. They sold them for a few cents a pound to make paper. Well, I was reading about that process one day, and I read that they could take black rags and gray rags and any color rag except red and make solid white paper. Now, if it didn't matter what color it was, they put all the rags in the hopper together. But if they were going to make white paper, they didn't want red pulverized with the other colors because red is the most stubborn stain on earth to get rid of. So when the rags were coming down the conveyor belt, they had someone sit there just to pick out the red ones and throw them aside. Unless you wanted a miserable pink, you had to get the red out if you wanted white. Maybe it's significant then that God said, though your sins be a scarlet, Burn in, die deep, stubborn stain. Though you are messed up in every respect and you don't see how on earth you can be saved, if you're just willing and obedient, I will take the red blood of my son and wash you. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm something of an artist. And I like to paint pictures. And I know something about blending colors. And I know you could take a little red and mix it with yellow and get brown. 
And you can take a little, no, I'm sorry, you mix red with yellow, you get orange. You take a little red and mix it with, 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 with brown, with, with green, I'm sorry, and you get brown. Let me get it together now. Red and yellow make orange. Red and green make brown. Red and blue make purple. Make what? I want you to remember that one. I'm coming back to it. Red and blue make what? Purple. But here is the great God of heaven saying, I'm going to take red and mix it with red and make white. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Lord, how are you going to do it? I'm going to take those red stains of sin and I'm going to cover them with the detergent of my son's crimson blood. And when I get through washing a sinner in that fountain filled with blood, he will lose all his guilty stain and I'll make you as white as snow. Red plus red equals white. The gospel of the colors. Way back in Old Testament times, God says, now folks, I've got a provision. But until the fullness of time, until I'm ready to send my son in the fullness of time, I want you to do something symbolic to exercise faith in the coming Lamb of God. I want you to get this tonight because it's coming back on Wednesday night. There's some people who become so, so much uh, dispensationalists that they believe the Old Testament is one thing and New Testament is another. And that the Old Testament is saved by works, New Testament by faith. That's foolish, that you. Everybody who goes to heaven is going by faith in Jesus. Would you say amen? The Old Testament killed lambs and pointed forward to Jesus. The New Testament takes communion and points backward to Jesus. But everybody meets at the cross. If Adam goes to heaven, he's going because Jesus died for his sins. And every time they killed a lamb, that lamb couldn't take away sin. Hebrews says that. The only thing that lamb could do was say to God, we believe that one day the lamb of God is coming. So we're killing this little lamb to exercise our faith. Just like you take communion and say to God, we believe that Jesus died, shed his blood, and his body was broken for my sins. They were pointing forward to Jesus. And God allowed this little provision, and God tolerated it in order to be able to receive his people again. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And God wanted them back so badly, he said, if you mess up, sin separates between us. Isaiah chapter 59 tells us that. Sin separates between us. But if you want to come back, kill the blood of a barnyard lamb, and I'll take you back. God was so anxious, he made this provision. And we are told by Josephus that at the time of Christ, the Jews were killing 250,000 lambs a day in Jerusalem alone. And the priests spent their entire lives with fire and flesh and smoke and blood. And yet the people were worse than ever. God said this thing isn't working out. Not working out! They promised to obey me. I put the blue on their garments to remind them. But they failed anyhow! And even though I've given them lambs as a token of their faith in the coming Lamb of God, they've come to the place they think they can do anything they want to just kill a lamb. And go do it again and kill a lamb. And that's the way folks are today. You've got millions of people in America who do any kind of dirt they want to do, just make it to confession, and then go do it again. God said, that is mockery! It's not working! So, way over in the Old Testament... Jeremiah 31, 31, and this is significant because Paul simply quoted Jeremiah in Hebrews. Are you saying amen out there? Way over in Jeremiah's day, God said, i got to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Are you listening? The old one isn't working, not because I'm not living up to my part of the bargain, but because my people are weak and won't live up to their part. It's not working, and yet I'm desperate to save them. My old covenant was for folk who were made in the image of God. Adam and Eve sold them into sin. The flesh is weak. Even though they have good intentions, they're not able to do right. They're just killing lambs and sinning again. i got to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, I'm quoting now. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Which covenant they break? But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will write my law on their inward parts. Are you listening to me? Some folks say that's the New Testament. Well, I want you to know it's in Jeremiah 31, 31. And all Paul did was quote it. God said, the day is coming 
when a new covenant is going to be ratified. You know, when Congress sends down a bill, the president has to sign it. Now, he can veto it. But when he signs it, he ratifies that bill, and it becomes law. Isn't that right? God says, I got a new covenant now, Jeremiah. Hundreds of years before the fact, I'm making an agreement. I'm going to send the power so that people will have not only external help, but internal help. I'm going to send the power so that if folk want to live right, they can. I'm going to send the power on earth that will write my law on the inside of a man. Right now, if a man wants to know what's right, he's got to go read the law. But I'm going to write that law in his mind so that he doesn't have to go read it. All he's got to do is think. I'm going to write my law in his heart and on his inward parts. This is the covenant I'm going to make, and I'm going to ratify it, not with the blood of bulls and of goats, but with the blood of the Son of God. Would you say amen out there? So Jesus came. And he found Israel in the worst shape she'd been in in centuries. Do you know there are 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew? God didn't even have a prophet in Israel that he could speak through. No scriptures were written for 400 years. The Jews had become so formalized in their religion. They were so interested in rituals and killing bulls and goats and pigeons that when the Lamb of God came, they didn't even recognize him. And make no mistake, they were without excuse. When Jesus started pressing his way toward the river Jordan to be baptized, John the Baptist called the attention of that crowd, and there were priests in that crowd. John said, Behold, that means stop and look, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The Jews had been looking for the Lamb of God for a long time. Ever since that day that Abraham was told to offer Isaac, they went up in the mountain, Mount Moriah, and Abraham built an altar, and he put the wood on it, and he had the fire, and he had the oil, and he had the knife. And Isaac said, Father, we got the fire, the wood, the knife, and the oil, but where is the lamb? For all those hundreds of years, Israel had been asking, where is the lamb? They had been looking for a Savior to come from one generation to another. They longed for the Messiah. Some were praying, oh God, where is the lamb? And one day, John saw him. He said, behold, there he is, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. But they kept on killing lambs. And on the very day... Passover day, the very day they screamed in Pilate's courtyard for the blood of Jesus. In the temple, they had a lamb getting ready to kill it. And when they took Christ up and laid him down on that cross, the priest picked up that little old lamb and laid him on the altar. And when they pounded those spikes into the hand of Jesus, the priest was whetting his knife to kill a lamb. The lamb of God was hanging out there on the cross, and he knew it not still trusting the barnyard animal. But finally, at about the ninth hour, Jesus screamed in his passion and yielded up the ghost, dropped his head in the hollow of his shoulder and died. And when he screamed, it is finished. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. The knife dropped out of the hand of the priest. The lamb jumped down off the altar and scampered out. He doesn't have to die now. The lamb of God has died. And the new covenant now is in effect. What are you talking about, preacher? The Lord said to his disciples after his resurrection, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. But I will not leave you comfortless. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he'll send you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it's, I'm quoting, John 14, 15 and down. Cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he shall be with you and in you. Say amen. The reason the Jews couldn't live up to their own expectations was, all of the power was external. Now Christ has ratified the new covenant. He's going back to heaven. He said to his disciples, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. The word expedient means necessary. Now they loved the Lord and they hated to see him go. But Christ had taken on humanity. And he still has our human nature. And Christ taking on humanity couldn't be in two places at one time. 
He couldn't be in Jericho and Galilee at the same time. He couldn't be in Jerusalem and China at the same time. So Jesus said, it's necessary that I go. And when I go, I'm going to send the omnipresent Holy Ghost down here. Unlike me, limited by human nature, he can be everywhere and anywhere at the same time. Let's say amen out there. Not only that, he can be with you. Now, I can be with you, but I can't get in you because I'm man. But when the Holy Ghost comes, he will be able to walk beside you and protect you and lift up a standard against the enemy. But whenever you need help, he's going to be in you. Well, when he comes in, what will he do? He's going to write my law on your mind. Lord, I thought the new covenant meant you did away with the law. Oh, no, 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 no. When the new covenant is realized, instead of having to read the law on stone, it's in your mind. I write it in your heart. Well, how does that work, Lord? Okay, here you are, trying your best to live right. Like the Jews of old, you intend to do right, but the flesh is weak. And here comes a very handsome woman. And that woman winks her eye, and she makes eyes at you. And she gives you a signal. And she comes up and squeezes your hand. And she flirts with you. And she invites you to profane and defile your marriage. Now, you can't sin without committing yourself to sin. People sin and say, well, I wasn't thinking. Yes, you were. Out of the heart of the issues of life. Every time you do wrong, you have to commit yourself to do wrong. You have to decide, okay, I'll do it. So here is a man being tempted. What does the new covenant do for him that the old covenant couldn't? He's got the law in his mind. Ordinarily, he'd have to run to the priest before he could answer that woman and say, what does the law say? But not now. It's written in his heart. So when he starts thinking, what does he think? He thinks what the law says. What does the law say? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's in his mind. And when he thinks the word of God, he is able to say to that no good wretch of a woman, get away from me. I wouldn't hurt my wife's little finger for all of you. Come on and say amen out there. This is the provision of the new covenant. Here is a man who is a sinner. He'll steal anything he can get his hands on. But when he's born again, there's a power within him. And when he sees some money that he can steal, he can stand there and look at it all day. Doesn't bother him now. Why? Because every time he thinks, he thinks, thou shalt not steal. It's written in his mind. Let's say amen out there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a converted man. This is the provision of the new covenant. It does not do away with God's will. It makes it so personal that it's in our minds. little girl in Africa joined the church. Her father was a witch doctor and he didn't like it. He beat her and he abused her, but she wouldn't change. And one day he announced to the tribe he's going to make an example of his own daughter. So they formed a huge circle in the courtyard and he built a fire in the middle And he put some stones in the fire. And he brought that girl out and he tied her up, his own daughter. And he said to her, now I'm going to give you a chance to give up that so-called religious faith. And if you don't give it up, you'll wish you had. And he begged her to give it up. And when she wouldn't, he reached in with a pair of tongs and he picked up a hot stone. And he took that stone and he lifted her arm up and he put it against her flesh. And as it was searing the flesh, he pressed her arm down on it. The little girl screamed in agony. And when he finally removed it, she said, Father, it's not under my arm. It's not under my arm. And in his anger and rage, he grabbed another hot stone and put it back of her knee and bit her leg up on it. And the smoke went up. The smell of scorching flesh filled the courtyard. The little girl screamed in torment. And when he finally took it away, she said, Daddy, it's not behind my leg. It's not behind my leg. And then the man in his rage and frustration yelled at her, Where is it then? She said, It's in my heart. It's in my heart. Christ says, I'll come into your heart. Write it in there so that you can't lose it. Write it in there so burglars can't steal it. Write it in there so that a house of fire can't burn it. I'll write it in your heart. Now, very quickly, as we get ready to go to the screen, I told you if you mix red with yellow, you get what? Orange. You mix red with green, you get brown. You mix red with blue, you get what? Now, I want to ask you a question. What is the color of royalty? Come on again. What's the color of royalty? 
God said, you are a royal priesthood. Well, how in the world do you get to be a part of God's royal family? And color of royalty is purple. How do you get to be that? you got to take the blue of obedience and mix it with the red of God's grace. And when you combine grace and obedience, faith and works, purple, sound of the king. Bless the name of the Lord. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came down here, ladies and gentlemen. He came down here to ratify the new covenant that God had. By the way, the old covenant is not out of style. It's still obey and live, disobey and die. In the end, those who don't obey are going to hell. Blessed are they that do his commandments. They shall have a right to the tree of life. Revelation 22, 14. It's still obey and live, disobey and die. The new covenant is simply a temporary provision until we are sealed for eternity. It is a provision God's made so that if a man wants to do right, he can do right. By the grace of God, Jesus came to make that possible, ladies and gentlemen. And oh, how he suffered to make that possible. His blood was shed. They beat him with that Roman whip until his back looked like a raw steak. And after beating him like that, they humiliated him. And they pressed the crown of thorns on his head. They snatched out his beard. They spit in his face until it dripped off his chin in all its abominable stench. Yet he opened not his mouth. As a lamb led to the slaughter, he bore it all. Jesus paid it all. To work out a plan by which you and I could live right if we wanted to live right. You can keep God's commandments. Woe unto the preacher that says you can't do it. Oh, yes, you can. God said, I'll write it in your heart. Christ went through all of that. The hand that created the world was fastened to a tree. The blood came trickling down, ratifying this covenant. Jesus paid it all, worked it out. The heaven's gates flung back now. There's a way. Jesus is the way. No longer barred. The mercy of God has triumphed. The justice of God is satisfied. At the cross, justice and grace shook hands. Righteousness and peace Kissed each other. Jesus paid it all. Let's say amen out there, beloved. Or let it touch your heart tonight. But what's our responsibility? Jesus said, you must be born again. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it with willpower. You need a new heart. I'll give you a heart transplant. The other night I was showing some slides to my family that I just took in Africa. And there is one huge, solid, white hospital that's right there in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, when my God took me there, he said, Pastor Brooks, this is the place where Dr. Christian Bonnard performed the first heart transplant. I thought to myself, that's the first one y'all know about. Once upon a time, the Lord Jesus Christ took my stony heart, gave me a heart of flesh, one that can even control my temper. I know it's a new heart. Because the things I used to do, I don't do no more, as the old spiritual said. Places I used to go, don't go no more. Things I used to love, I now despise. And things I once wasn't interested in, I love. New heart. That's what you got to have. And when you got it, you know it. You don't have to do a lot of talking. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Christ is your example, not some philosopher or some great preacher or theologian. Jesus, Jesus, and woe unto me and to my preaching. If I ever stop holding up Jesus, I don't want anybody to follow me except as I follow Jesus. If you hear that Pastor Brooks has lost his way, just know that Brooks is gone, but the truth abideth still. Christ is still the answer. Would you say amen? You ought to walk as he walked. And Jesus said, I kept my Father's commandments. That's John fifteen ten. 
He kept the Sabbath. That's Luke 4.16. He was kind and patient and temperate and meek and loving. We ought to walk as Jesus walked if we claim to be good. The only way to do that is to be born again. You can't do this by making your decision that on my own can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots. Then may he do good who are accustomed to doing evil, the Bible says. You stand as much chance of living right by willpower as a black man does becoming white and a leopard does becoming a panther. The Bible says so. The only way you're going to live right is to come under the provision of the new covenant. You got to be born again. You got to let Jesus come in. You got to make a surrender to Him. You got to give Him credit for knowing more than you know. You got to give Him credit for being wiser than you are. You got to put your opinions aside and take the Word of God. You got to surrender to Christ. You got to commit your life to Him. You got to confess your sins. You got to be willing to reject those sins. Christ says, Every time I'll take you. I don't care how rotten you've been. You might have been a harlot or a drunkard or a drug addict. I don't care. If you do that, I'll take you and I'll give you a new heart. Then you can keep the Sabbath. Come on and say amen. Then you stop making excuses and trying to hide behind something and running to preachers to see what they have to say about what God has said clearly. Then you will straighten up. Amen. Well, Lord, how are you going to work this out? He said, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. They hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Over there in the Middle East where my wife and I were, they got lots of shepherds. And they graze their flocks. You can see them all. You see them in places where you don't even see any grass. They're out there where the sheep nibble on thorn bush and take leaves off little old shrubs. And water is hard to find over there. So there'll be a common water hole. And at 12 o'clock, they might all come together. Thousands of sheep. Thousands of sheep. And the shepherds are friends, and they'll go sit down together and eat their bread and oil. And their sheep get all mixed up drinking and, and fraternizing. And finally, one shepherd is ready to go. And I asked the question, how do you get them untangled? Oh, the man said, that's easy. He said, when a shepherd is ready to go, he just walks away from the other shepherds, and he gives a little cry. And every sheep that belongs to him knows his voice. And he starts coming out of the crowd. And he starts lining up behind the shepherd. Down here in Washington, D.C., God's got some sheep. Some of them are drunkards tonight. Some of them are dope addicts tonight. Some of them are addicted to cigarettes tonight. Some of them are adulterous tonight. And they're all mixed up with the devil's crowd. But Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice. They know my voice. And the Lord is calling tonight through his word. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And as the Lord calls, his sheep are going to walk out of the crowd. They're going to line up behind the shepherd. They're going to follow Jesus. Would you say amen out there? That's what the Bible teaches. We are his witnesses of these things. So is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that do what? Now that Holy Ghost is what gives you the power. And he's not going to waste his Holy Ghost on hypocrites. He's going to give it to those who are committed to obey him. He's going to give his Holy Ghost to those who are willing to live right. There's some folk talking about, I got the Holy Ghost, and they're doing anything they're big enough to do. All they're doing is destroying confidence in the grace of God. Causing sinners not to even want to know Jesus. God wants somebody who is willing to live right. Somebody willing to deny himself. Somebody who can give up these old filthy movies and give up cigarettes and give up liquor and give up carousing and give up reading juicy magazines and wasting their time before the television with these old stupid cereals. Jesus wants somebody willing to live right. And when you're willing, he says, I'll give you the Holy Ghost. Once you get it, you can do it. Don't you let anybody tell you you can't obey God. Yes, you can. The question is whether you want to or not. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice. Now I want you to get that. People come to my house sometimes and they knock. And usually you can hear the knocking. The Lord says, I'm not just knocking. I'm calling. If you hear my voice, I'm knocking at your heart. Every time you feel like staying at home at night, and some says, you ought to go on out and hear Pastor Brooke. That's him knocking. That's him knocking. Every time you, you feel like you don't, don't want to be bothered, and something says, oh, go ahead. 
That's him knocking. But once you get out here, you hear the word of God. That's him calling. He said, if any man hear my voice and open up, I'll come into him. He didn't say now, if all the educated people open up, I'll come in. He didn't say if all the big shots open up. He didn't say if all those who've lived carefully all their lives. He said, if any man, no good, rotten, worn out, good for nothing sinner, if any man open, I'll come in. And I'll sup with him and he with me. What do you mean sup with me? Man shall not live but by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Lord, if we're going to have supper, what are we going to eat? We're going to feast on the word of God. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. I'm going to deal with you in such a way that not only will you hear the word, but you're going to chew it. And you're going to swallow it. And you're going to digest it. You're going to understand it. It's going to become strong inside of you. Just like physical food gives you strength, the Word of God will make you strong. I'll come in to any man. And that's the gospel of the cousins. Oh, praise the Lord. I ride along in my car sometimes, and I get to thinking about the things I've done, and I feel so unworthy. And I said, Lord, how can you love somebody like me? And he says to me in my meditations, I so love the world that whosoever believeth on me shall not perish. Brooks, I am determined you shall not perish. The devil is determined to get you, but if you're willing and obedient, I'm going to give you a gift that'll keep you. I'm going to knock at your heart's door. And if you let me in, I'm going to feed you with the Word. And whenever you eat, you get strong. I'm going to see to it that you make it. You struggle. You stumble. You make mistakes. But I'm not going to leave you, not forsake you. I'm going to bring you through. Sometimes I ride along smiling to myself. Because Jesus has spoken to me. Folks see me in other cars, wonder who's in there with me. Bless his holy name. Oh, it's time to close. Jesus is our Savior. I told him when we started these meetings, Lord, I got to preach some doctrines, but I want folk to see Jesus because they're not going to do the doctrine until they see Jesus. I want to lift you up. Oh, for the tongue of an angel to tell you about Jesus tonight. Bless his holy name. Do you love him tonight? Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Now I'm going to ask you a question. And I don't even know who you are, but you've got to answer this question. You've got to answer this question. Do you understand now that Jesus isn't doing away with his law? Answer me. Do you understand that He gives power to obey? Answer me. Do you want to obey by His grace? Answer me. Lord, you heard us. You heard us, Lord. These are your people. And I love them. But I can't love them like you. You didn't send me down here to tell folks all about hell. You sent me down here to tell them there's a way to go to heaven. There's a way to live right. And even though the crowd seems hell-bent on doing evil, there's a way by which a man can live right. He doesn't have to make excuses. That's what you told me to tell him. Lord, have mercy on us tonight. We want to be Christians. we got some decisions to make. We've got to keep your commandments. And we've got to have some power to do that. We don't even want to keep the Sabbath yet. You've got to come into our hearts and make us willing. And we're asking you to do that tonight. Don't let anybody go away from here the same as he came. We've been in your presence tonight, Lord. i got sense enough to know that you've been here tonight. Touch us with grace. As we go to our homes, don't let us go to sleep. 
until we've made that commitment. And then let us sleep peacefully, rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why should you love us so? Why do you go to all this trouble for us? Thank you, Lord. There is hope for you who are by the Spirit wooed. There is hope for you just claim His precious blood. There is hope for you who are plunged beneath that flood. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you when you're loyal and true. There is hope, I say, who trust and obey too. There is hope in Christ. His grace embraces you. There is hope in Christ for you. Now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace in your hearts, peace in your homes. Tomorrow night, by the grace of God, our subject is going to be a subject of hope. If you know people who feel they've gone too far, if you know folks who are so rotten you don't see what can help them, our subject tomorrow night is God in bad company. Don't miss it, folks. You need to bring sinners with you tomorrow night. They need to hear this, not because I preach it. I don't care who preaches it. They need to hear this. Oh, precious Lord, keep us safe. Bring us back then, we pray. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.